Good morning, everyone. I appreciate Mike reading the whole chapter of Judges 7. Um, it's better than me standing here and reading it right now. We're going to uh, look at a few things, but I really wanted to uh, thank my wife, who's not here. It's her birthday. She just went downstairs. Um, she's the glue that holds our family together, and I just appreciate her so much and how much she takes care of myself and Ryan. And I just wanted to, uh, to wish her happy birthday. And now she's not two years younger than me, just one. So that's a good thing. So, in Judges, we see that God, or the sermon for today is, God does not need a large army. In Judges, verses 2, God goes and God does not need an army of great number to claim victory. He doesn't want the Israelites to have the glory. He wants them to rely on him and to give God the glory. In verse 3, God says, If they're afraid, whatever, tell them to depart. Now, 32,000 men sounds like a pretty decent-sized army. And it was. But we learned later on in the chapter, you couldn't even count the camels from the Midianites and from the people from the east. So that was a pretty good size army, but I think the Midianites were much greater than 32,000 men. Well, then 10,000 returned. And God said, that's still too many. Now, if I'm Gideon and I'm leading this army, I'm thinking, I'd like to have those 22,000 men back, please, God. But Gideon, but God said, no. So he says he put him through a test. So 10,000 men go down to this stream and only God uses 300 of them. That's an amazing thing to think about. You go from 32,000 soldiers down to 300. Where is your reliance at then? It certainly is not on the numbers that you have. It's on God. So the through the following verses, God tells Gideon exactly what to do. And they follow his instructions. That's the key right here. They follow God's instructions. That night, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and then all the men of the east, God turns them on each other and they flee. Then God allowed the call to go out to destroy them. I believe God's purpose was to show no army of great size and strength can stand up to those that follow and do what God says. Amen. God only needs a few to do great things in his name. I want to look at a few people in the Bible that lends to this concept that God does not need a large amount of people to show his glory. The first example I'd like to look at is Noah and his family in Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, God is sorry that he ever created man. He regretted it so much that he saw evil reign and multiply as men and women did, and he was ready to destroy them. But then in verse 8, and boy, wouldn't you want God to say this about you? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's a beautiful passage that we hardly ever talk about. But maybe one of these days we'll do a sermon on Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Once again, one family is used to save humanity. We all know the story of the ark. Two by two animals, one male, one female, entered the ark, and the mosquitoes somehow got on there too. <coughs> Noah and his wife, three sons and three daughter-in-laws were sealed up in the ark by the Lord because they had done exactly what God had told them to do. They built the ark exactly the way that God had told them to build it. Now, once if they would have used redwood, it would not have survived. What happens if they would have built it one inch shorter than what they did? It wouldn't have survived. What happens if they would have put a motor on it? I know they didn't have motors, but they wouldn't survive. God, they did it just the way that God did it. And that is beautiful, isn't it? Is it not beautiful? It's scary. Why is it scary? For what was going on outside. That's why it was scary. 
Noah tried to convince them what to do what God wanted to be done. But Noah tried to no avail. People would not listen to him. But only eight were left to start all over again. And that shows that God does not need a great army or multitudes of people to show his glory. He was shown through Noah and his family. Now we're going to spend some time on this next one because it's one of the greatest examples that I see in the Bible. David versus Goliath. How can that not be one of the best examples for this? Now I don't know how many of you have played sports but I was played basketball and baseball at a very small high school. We had eight people on our starting, when I was a senior, starting in basketball. So back in those days, we were allowed to have a minister or someone come in and they always prayed with us before the game. I don't know if that still continues nowadays or not, but I would say it's probably it's not as much as what it did back then. Well, we were going in to play our game against, uh, well, Bellsville. Well, Linda would know where that's at. And our school had won seven straight times in the sectionals. We had lost to Bellsville twice that year by small amounts of points. So what story do you think, and Bellsville was big, they had a guy that was 6'6", 350 pounds, another guy 6'8", fast guards. They were so much bigger than us. Our tallest guy was 6'2". I was listed in the program as 6'4", by the way, just so you know. So it was kind of neat. But the, but the minister, the preacher came to us. We all gathered around and what was the first thing he did? He said, as David slayed Goliath, so shall Skyview slay Bellsville. So man, we all get pumped up and then we, he does a little, the prayer and then we all go out there and we get thumped the first half of the game. We're down by 12 points at halftime. Come back in, our coach yells and screams at us and then we go back out on the court. And guess what happens? We slayed Bellsville by four points and moved on. We had the same prayer when we played Tri-C the next week. They beat us by 23 points. <laughs> they were a big team. But I want to talk a little bit again. Once again, the scriptures are well known in 1 Samuel 17. You have two armies facing each other. The Philistines and their great champion, Goliath. Now Goliath stood six cubics, which roughly relates out to be six feet nine inches tall. Now remember the average height back then for a man was between five five and five six. So being six nine and broad as he was, he was a giant. He had heavy armor, heavy weaponry, and believe it, he was a true and true and tried tested warrior. He could slay anything. In today's age, we would say he was probably a man among men. He'd be easily recognized. And I bet you that everybody knew who Goliath was. We get to the story of David, who's the youngest son of three. His father uses him basically as a messenger and a caregiver for his older brothers, and he took care of the sheep. We know that he was young, small in stature. He herded sheep. So he didn't carry weapons or armor, and especially he had no skill in battle. So I want to start with 1 Samuel. Seventeen. Starting in verse 21. This is a lengthy reading, but I'd like to read it all. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army, and David left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then, he, as, then as he talked with them, 
there was the champion, the Philistine of Goth, Goliath my, by name, coming out from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw him, fled from him and was dreadfully afraid. These are seasoned soldiers, dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father house exemption from taxes to Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood there by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is uncircumcised who for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Man, does you speak well there, doesn't it? That he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him in a manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. But Elijah his Eliba, I'm sorry, his oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliba's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence in your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, and David said What have I done now? Is there no cause? Then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they, rep they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fall, fail because of him. Your servant will do, go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are, not, are you are you not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him? For you are a youth. And he is, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, and I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from the mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard, and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, these and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Now we look here and we see these two great armies facing each other. Now back in this day, the armies didn't always fight each other. They had champions, what they called champions. And Goliath was a champion of the Philistines. Well, I'm sure that the armies of Israel had a champion also, but all of them feared away. So these two champions normally would fight each other, and whoever won, the other king would be in subjection to that king's rule. So whoever would fight Goliath, if they would lose, Israel becomes in subjection to the Philistines. But what happened here? As we continue to see, Saul and David talk, and Saul tries to give armor and weapons to David, but David can't walk. It has to be an amazing picture to see David. Do you imagine putting on that helmet? Probably spun all the way around his head. The armor, he probably could move, and I could just see the sword from here and it's dragging on the ground behind him because he's such a small man. He couldn't walk. But what he did do is he went and picked up five smooth stones and challenged Goliath in what? In the name of the Lord. Not in the name of Saul or in the name of David, but in the name of the Lord. We all know that David slung a stone at Goliath, sinking it into his forehead, and the power of God was shown in one young small boy as he slayed Goliath. Once again, armies were not needed. God did not need Israelites' champion. He wanted his glory shown, and David showed his glory. Again, a large number is not needed to show the power of God. Only one was needed to show God's glory. I want to move up into 
New Testament, Acts chapter 2. I want to talk about the church. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 32. To the end of the chapter. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he has says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Set at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about three thousand souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came, up, came upon the every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continually, daily, with one accord in the temple, and the breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We see here that Peter and the apostles are preaching the word. Jesus. They're, they're preaching Jesus. And about 3,000 souls were baptized that day. They all continued together in the breaking of bread and taking care of one, one another. But verse 47, the key is here. And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. The church refers to just one church. Not churches, not man-made religions, not creeds, not doctrines of men. The Lord has a church and only one church. It was established by Jesus through the apostles. The only way in is through the Lord. No man can lay hands on somebody and you're saved. They can't, someone can't tell you to put your hands on the TV and all of a sudden you're saved. You can't get a phone call and say, call this number back and you'll be saved. There's only one way and that's through the Lord. And then those in verse 41 who gladly received his words were baptized. God does not need multiple churches in the way that they want to worship God. God only needs His church and for it to worship Him the way that He defines worship. So God does not need 6,500 different religions because there's only one religion, one church. And that's what we have to remember. <clears throat> the last one I want to look at is God only needed to send one Savior to save the world. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God could have saved the world in many ways he wanted to. I'm just going to throw a couple hypotheses out there just for fun. You know that God could have sent down as many people as he wanted at one time. And he, those people could have fell out of heaven, landed on earth, not been hurt, and stood up and said, you know I'm from heaven, and you better start following what God wants you to do or you're gone. 
He could have done that. Or even greater is, he could have opened up the skies. Could you imagine this? You're standing there farming one day, and all at once the skies open up, and God speaks directly to you. I am God. Worship me properly, or you shall perish. Now that would scare all around the world at the same time. That would scare a lot of people. But God didn't do it that way. Well, what did God do? God sent his only begotten son, his only son. He was born to a virgin in a totally helpless state. Now, I could spend several hours here going through it, but we know that Jesus grew up, remained sinless, even through, though tested, in every way. And he went to that cross on Calvary took entire sin on him and he died and was buried and resurrected for us one man Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior God did not use an army he used only Jesus and we can be saved because of that folks I know we've been through some tough times here lately and the decisions here at the congregation haven't been easy. This sermon today has been weighing on my heart for quite a few weeks now. The one thing I want you to take from today is this. God uses those that glorify Him. And God uses small numbers to accomplish great things in His name. And God can use one tiny congregation to glorify his name and we need to remember that no matter how many people are here we need to stay and remind that so let's show God's glory to be shown through us no matter the number I want us all to unite for the glory of God if you'll pray with me please Heavenly Father I am so thankful to you for this congregation here in Kent I thank you for each and every one that makes up its body, Father. I thank you for the talent and the ability that you have sent here, Father, at this time. I am just amazed that the way that you take care of things, Father, through this congregation and through the men and women that make up this congregation. Father, it is a pleasure to serve you here. Father, it is a pleasure to try to glorify you in everything that we do. And Father, I am so happy to be a child of yours that worships here in Kent, Ohio. I thank you for the college students that come our way. I thank you for the families that make up this congregation. I thank you for the strength that you give us Father, even in times that we are not strong, we can always turn to someone and be lifted up, and I thank you for that. Father, it is a true blessing to be here and a true measure of your grace upon us, and I thank you so much for that, Father. Father, please, please continue to watch over us, to guide us, to lead us, Let us become stronger in your word. Let us become stronger in our faith towards you. And let us, at the very end of time, when our time is done here, come home to you, Father. And I thank you for that. But Father, we especially thank the head of our church, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He was one but he has saved the world if they choose to follow him. And that was one man, Father. And it's amazing the glory that was shown through him to us by you. And may we never forget what he's done for us. And Father, as we end this prayer, I thank you for just being able to serve you on this earth and this congregation thanks you as they serve you father and we are so so amazed each and every day by you and it's in jesus name we pray amen
If there's anything we could do for you today, if you need help in any way, come as we stand and sing.